And as you sit, if you take your Bibles with you this morning and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to be concluding this chapter this morning as we consider verses 20 and 21. I will be reading starting at verse 17 for context. Let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Our gracious God, we do thank you now for your word. We pray that your spirit would open it to us. We pray, Lord, that we would see Jesus in the pages of Scripture, that we would understand your truth in refreshing ways this day, that you would encourage our hearts, that you would uplift us and comfort us, we pray. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Well, Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 17. Here now, the holy, inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God, written for you and for me today. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, people of God, Paul's prayer has been so rich and encouraging to us, hasn't it? As we've considered the portions of the prayer over the last few weeks, we can say that Paul asked a lot of God. He brought many petitions before him on behalf of God's people. His great concern was for them and for us and our full-orbed health and well-being. Paul desired God's rich blessing and, and work in his people by his Spirit in ways that would build us up, would encourage us and strengthen us, even to the very core of our beings, to the depths of our souls. And this is important as Paul shifts in chapter 4 from the indicative, in other words, what we must know, to speak to the imperative, what we must therefore do. Really, doctrine in action, the, the Christian life being seen as we pursue living according to God's truth. And so Paul prayed that the knowledge of God's love would be the goal of our strength, that he is working in us. Paul emphasized the need for us to be rooted and grounded in love. He prayed that we would be like deeply planted trees and secure. He prayed that we would be well-built buildings when it comes to love on a solid foundation. Paul wanted us to be strong and stable in God's love, which is also evident in our love for one another. But he also prayed that in strengthening, we would grow in knowledge, even an intimate knowledge and experiential knowledge of the deep, deep love of Jesus. And it's this love that Paul prayed God would open our minds to comprehend. It's this love that's inexhaustible. It's this love that we can't fully know, but are called to grow in knowing more and more of. The love of Christ, my friends, is the soil in which our own love grows and flourishes, moving us to fulfill our call to further God's plan through the pursuit of loving unity in the church. Now, though the gospel is undoubtedly our chief example of the self-sacrificial love of Christ, 
How else do we see and grow in our knowledge of Christ's love? Do we not see and know more of it as Scripture reveals to us Christ giving us his law and commands, his nurture of us, his care and compassion toward us, his guidance of us, his discipline and chastening of us, his sanctifying us and growing us by his Spirit. Christ's love is is so great and unsearchably rich that it's a joy to know it, it's a joy to be the recipients of it, and it's a joy to pursue knowing more of it. And so as we consider Paul's concluding words of his prayer this morning, I encourage you to remember back and think back to his words at the beginning of chapter 1, when Paul, after greeting the saints, couldn't but open his mouth in praise. If you remember those words, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And he said these things as he would go on to teach us rich theological truths in Christian doctrine. But Paul's words were also doxological, weren't they? They ascribed praise to God. Paul began this indicative section of the book in doxology at the beginning of chapter 1, and we do well to note that he ends chapter 3 in doxology as well. Really, that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? It's a, it's a picture of what the Christian life should look like in many ways. We praise God for his person, for his work, and revelation to us even of himself in Scripture, and even of his salvation of us, our redemption in Scripture through Christ. And as we continue to grow in knowledge and maturity of his truth, that leads us to praise him more. That's what we see in Paul, isn't it? Our growth in theology leads us to doxology. Our growth in theology leads us to doxology. And as we consider Paul's doxology this morning, we will do so looking at two things. I know it's going against the Presbyterian outline of three. Okay. <laughs> Two things, God's power in verse 20 and God's glory in verse 21. God's power in verse 20 and his glory in verse 21. So as we look at verse 20, we see his infinite power. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Now look at those first six words for a moment. Now to him who is able. Paul knows he who is able. He is praising him. He is addressing the one in whom his praise is ascribed to, whom he is lifting his praise to. Now to him God has the ability, beloved, and the resources. He has the power. He is God Almighty. Now let's take a few moments and let's look at a few scriptures that teach us these important truths that even support Paul's words of ascription of praise here. We can start in Genesis 17, verse 1. God said as much regarding himself to Abram in that verse. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. This is who I am. Therefore, this is what you must do. I am Almighty God. 
I have all power. Sovereign, complete, full, no one greater, no one more powerful. Why? Because God's power is infinite. He is an infinite and eternal being, supreme, almighty. So he tells Abram, his creature, to walk before him and be blameless. Remember God's words after he told Abraham that Sarah would have a child in chapter 18, just a chapter over, verses 13 and 14. In the context in 13 we read, And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? But notice verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. The clear answer is no. There is nothing that is too hard for the Lord. There is nothing that is too hard for the great and sovereign God of the universe. Jeremiah spoke to this also in his prayer in Jeremiah 32, verses 17 and 18. He said there, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power, an outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. You show loving kindness to thousands and repay the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. The great, the mighty God, whose name is the Lord of hosts. There's so many pieces, even in those packed two verses, that are speaking to what we're looking at and considering even here, to him who is able. Who is he? He's the great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. Jeremiah says correctly and rightly, there is nothing too hard for you. But also consider Paul's benediction that he gave the church in Rome. In Romans 16, 25 and 27, through 27, especially how he begins as he ascribes praise to God. He says, Now to him who is able to establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures, made known to all the nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God. For obedience to the faith, to God, alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And so yet again, we see Paul speak, different congregation, nonetheless, part of the body of Christ, our brothers and sisters, again, ascribing praise to God and his ability. He is completely able. Remember what Paul has already taught us about God's power and ability, even in the chapters in Ephesians that we've already considered. It was by his power that he raised Christ from the dead. It was by this same power, Paul said, that God brought us from death to life in Christ. So as we've considered before, God has the endless, abundant resources and riches of his grace and glory to give us from. Paul showed us this in God's blessing us with every spiritual blessing in Christ. He's not only all-powerful, he has endless resources, endless resources of grace and and glory. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. Our God is not stingy when it comes to pouring out his blessings 
in Christ to his people. He gives us it all, all that we need. So when we consider, study, or even talk about God's power, it's helpful to know two aspects of that power as revealed in Scripture. What we refer to as God's absolute power and his ordinate power. Stephen Charnock, a well-known Puritan, helpfully explains these two aspects of God's power when he says, absolute is that power whereby God is able to do that which he will not do, but is possible to be done. Ordinate power is that power whereby God doth that which he hath decreed to do, that is, which he hath ordained and appointed to be exercised which are not distinct powers, but one and the same power. So he's saying the absolute aspect of his power and the ordinate aspect, it's not that they're distinct powers. They're one and the same power. Um, you could say maybe that his ordinate power is viewed as a subset of his absolute power. His ordinate power is a part of his absolute, Charnock said, for if he had not power to do everything that he could will, he might not have the power to do everything that he doth will. Beloved, God is omnipotent. We know that. We see that in Scripture in many places. But it's important and good and helpful for us to consider it again, even as we consider Paul's words of doxological praise to him who is able. He is omnipotent. He can do anything and everything, and he does so in accordance with his nature in limitless fashion. There is no limit to his power. However, his power is used in accordance with his will. He does all his holy will desires. Know that there is something that God cannot do. God cannot sin. He is perfectly holy, just, and righteous, and he cannot do what is against his nature. But notice here that what Paul did say, God is able to do in verse 20. In his omnipotence, exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now, Paul didn't say this to raise a challenge as if you could legitimately say, well, you know, Pastor, I could think or ask a lot. I could even go so far as to say, I think about much more than comes out of my mouth. My list would be very long. No, Paul's message was, know your God. Know your God. Grow in knowing his power, his riches, his grace, and his love. This is, this is coming right after. You know, we preach sermons and look at sections in their messages, and, and we, we break these prayers apart to identify and look at specific things, right? But as we look at the flow of his prayer, this is coming right after what? Him praying that we would know the love of Christ. For those who may have questions about whether you're too needy or whether you have too many petitions, maybe you doubt or are discouraged with uncertainty in your mind about God and his intentions toward you or his ability. If those things are you, look at Paul. Paul recognized that his list of requests and petitions was long. He asked God for a lot on behalf of the Ephesians, not to mention all of God's people, looking at all of his other letters and the prayers and petitions that were there and beyond. Paul was a faithful apostle. He was a faithful shepherd. He was a faithful pastor. He prayed to the Lord, and he prayed for his people. He wasn't bashful about that. He was confident as we should be, and he's taught us to be in coming before the throne of grace. But 
But Paul could never have too many petitions. And neither can we. Here's his point. The grace and mercy of God is inexhaustible. Our prayers, the prayers of all the saints, can never draw his grace and mercy dry. They never can. Whatever we may ask or even think to ask, God is able to do more, exceedingly abundantly more, It doesn't matter how often or how wide you open your mouth to the Lord, He is able to fill you. He is able to comfort you. He is able to give you everything that you need in this life and the next according to His will and His word. So take heart and be encouraged in your faith by his all-sufficiency and his almighty power. There is nothing our God cannot do. And there is much that our God promises to do because of Christ. Now, Paul says God is able to do this, notice, according to the power that works in us. Paul's taught us about this power before, hasn't he? Again, God's power displayed in Christ's resurrection, his power displayed in our salvation as he brought us from death to new life in Christ are in view here. And Paul again points out that God isn't showing his power as a mere external force that we observe, but nothing else. No, we experience God's power at work in us by his spirit. Paul here makes an intimate connection between God's power and its work in the hearts and lives of his people. And further, God fills us with his fullness, and as he does so, he gives us the experience of his power. And having said all of this, because of the power that God has given to his church in Christ, Paul then ascribes glory to him. Notice that in verse 21. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. My friends, God the Father receives the glory for great things he has done. And this glory, the word doxa in Greek is where we get the word doxology from. It's frequently used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to translate a Hebrew word that means heavy. The Old Testament word for glory means heavy in its root. When people in Scripture come face to face with the glory of God, what happens? What is true? They cannot but fall on their face considering the heaviness of God's glory. The word doxa literally refers to praise and honor. And so, beloved, giving glory to God is actively praising and honoring and acknowledging and in many ways It's an act of worship to him for who he is, for what he has done, and what he will do. God is all-glorious. We do not give him glory for the purpose or in the sense that he is somehow absent or needing of glory. God is all-glorious. He calls us to give glory to him, not to fill a hole or a void or a gap. But because it is pleasing and it is right for him to do, for us to do so, uh, it's pleasing to him and right for us to do so as he calls us and to consider who he is and who we are as his creatures. It is a wonderful thing 
It's an honor. It's a privilege to be able to praise and to give honor to the living and triune God. But notice where Paul says God is glorified. He says, in the church, by Christ Jesus to all generations. God is to be glorified in the church by Christ. Again, our union with Christ is front and center. God glorifies himself in Christ. And why is God to be glorified in the church? Because he is powerfully redeeming the church. Christ died for his people, the church. And therefore, the glorifying of God is done in and through the church. And that's important. It's important to remember. It's an important thing to encourage us, to give us motivation in our connection and our involvement in Christ's church. Indeed, to be present as we worship together as the body of Christ, as we are giving praise and honor and glory to God, even in the midst of corporate worship, God is glorified in the church in Christ. And further, notice that our praising and glorifying God is through and in Christ. As Paul has aptly taught us, all of God's gifts and graces come from him to us through the hand of Christ. And all our praises and honor pass from us to him through Christ. Romans 11, verse 36. Paul told the saints there, For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. And Peter in 1 Peter 4.11 said, In all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The glory, all of it, belongs to him. He desires that we glorify him. And therefore we must. And finally, note that Paul teaches that this glory is to be given by all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's important that we, even as a congregation that comprises multiple generations, right, that all of the generations are learning and studying and growing together, that we are growing in this knowledge of God, that we were growing in the love of Christ, that we are growing in these things that we are even praising him for, and God's call to be praised and glorified and receive glory from his people. So we need to teach these things to our children. We need to teach these things that they would pass it on to their children until the Lord returns. God will always and forever, remember, God will always and forever have a people to praise him and give him glory. That's true now. That's true when he takes us home and for all eternity. As we will be praising him there forever and ever. So as we conclude chapter 3 in this wonderful book, I encourage you to look back and to even go back and reread these chapters, to study them, and to be fed by the Lord in the rich, deep truths about him, about the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ, about Christ and his person and his work for you in your salvation, about his wondrous work and the mystery revealed regarding the unity of the, his people in his church, and the rich work of his power and his grace in you and his people. I pray that as you do so, that the Spirit will bring to a place, bring you to a place where you cannot but pray. 
that you cannot but praise, giving all glory to God. And may we as a congregation do the same. I also pray that you would consider these verses this morning and that you would consider the God who is able, that you would consider the God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ask and think. Have great awe regarding him, but also have great comfort and encouragement regarding what he can and what he will do as he's revealed to you in his word, what he promises to you that are of aid to you, to all of us, even as we walk with him here today. For really, in many ways, as we look at the first three chapters, they are a good foundation of truth and knowledge that will then be of great benefit as we consider how we are called to live in the final three chapters. Again, the indicative and the imperative. And so in chapter 4, Paul starts off right out the gate and saying, therefore, this is what you must do. This is how you must live. And isn't it right? Isn't it good? Isn't it wonderful? That he ends the indicative portion of this book in chapter 3 in prayer and praise and doxology. Amen. Praise God for his word. Let's pray together.